how will this technology change your life? He was using uh, university servers at night to mine for, for, uh, for Bitcoin and some altcoins. In that respect, what would you say the real purpose of cryptocurrency is? The real purpose is, is creating a better version of money. Simple as that. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, the reason we invited you to come and speak to us was to learn more about DadCoin and the vision for DadCoin because we've been hearing quite a lot about DadCoin recently. Well, thank you for reaching out. I'm more than happy to, uh, to spend some time here with you and, and to answer your questions. Thank you. So let's get going. Absolutely. So the first question is very simple. Tell us more about you. Um, I'm one of the founders of, uh, of a cryptocurrency called DACQUIN. Currently, I'm a CVO, the Chief Visionary Officer of the currency. And, um, and we are working on, on building the, I would say, the first usable cryptocurrency that there really is. You said that your job role was Chief Visionary Officer. So what would you say your vision for a better world would be? As as a consequence of DAGCoin? As a consequence of DAGCoin, I, I would more say that as a consequence of technology. Because DAGCoin is just something that is built on the technology, but the important thing is technology what, and what that can do. And uh, it's especially the distributed ledger technology, blockchain, DAG chain, any, any, other, any other version of, uh, of a distributed ledger, which actually changes the world completely from what it is today to something that I would say it's more fair, it's more accessible, it's um, more equal, more transparent. And um, I, would, I would really like to see a lot of people having more possibilities and more control of their own lives than they have today. Okay, so if, if you, you, know, you say you want people to have more control of their lives and what they're doing, so if they're using, obviously, as a consequence of the technology, if you, I don't know, let's say you're a person living now in Botswana, how will this technology change your life? So you're, you're a guy just like you, same age, same hopes and ambitions. Like how do you see it impacting that person's life and making it better? I'm personally not very much aware of the situation in Botswana, how it is, I can just assume. And of course, it, it also depends what kind of life that that young person is having. Um, if, for example, he is from a wealthy family, then probably he doesn't have too many challenges in life. But there are a lot of people who have a lot of challenges. And uh, I would say one of the biggest things that technology can actually give people is access to money. You know, everybody has cash which they can use. But access to money is, is having access to digital money. And digital, everything that is digital, almost everything, is also global. So if you have money which you can use globally, that means you can buy or sell something, uh, let's say a product or a service from other countries, from other counties, from other cities, then that is a big advantage. It's, it's also an advantage for, for people to to maybe be able to, to have some um, welfare payments from, uh, from the governments. Um, local, uh, let's say that young, uh, young man is, is working in, uh, on his father's uh, land, for example. They have a small, small patch where they grow some, uh, some vegetables or, or, uh, or crops and they want to sell it. Right now, the only possibility where they can sell it is to the local whole buyer. That whole buyer, of course, makes a lot of money because he doesn't have much competition. He says, I will buy it for this price, you take it or leave it. But now having access to internet, having access to technology, having access to digital money gives that family the possibility to sell the same crops much further. They can sell it to the manufacturer. They can maybe sell it to the manufacturer in some other country, in some other continent, which means the people who are really working hard on the field, they will get much, much more money for that. 
So in that respect, would you say it could be seen in some ways as an extension to fair trade, giving people at the bottom who are creating something an opportunity to get a more fair price than, than they would get maybe from buyers in their local area or people, you know, it is people mo monopolizing most the market. Most definitely, it's something that enhances that, for sure, 100%. So what got you first interested in cryptocurrencies? Mm. When I was studying in IT uh, in university, then uh, I had a schoolmate who was, uh, who was telling me about this. That was in 2010, I think so. And um, he was using uh, university servers at night to mine for, for, uh, for Bitcoin and some altcoins. And um, he told me to uh, join with him on this uh, venture. I, I wasn't really interested. And, and then a few, a, few year, a few years after that, uh, when cryptocurrency started to get more traction in the media, I started to look more into it. And then, then there were some companies that, uh, that uh, started promoting uh, different cryptocurrencies. And, and um, it caught my attention. I started learning about it. Uh, seeing what there is on, on the market, experimenting, testing here and there. So for the past, I think now about four, four or five years, I have been uh, somewhat in the, in the industry, looking around, seeing what companies are doing, um, how they're developing, um, what they're focusing on. And um, it was quite, quite fast when I understood that uh, the vision, the initial goal, of, uh, of cryptocurrency and, and I understood what it can do, how much it can influence the whole world, how much it can change. But unfortunately, there are not uh, too many companies focusing on the, on the right things. And uh, that is one thing that, that pushed me to, uh, to work stronger in the industry and, and to create something that, uh, that would have the focus on, on the real purpose of what cryptocurrency really is about. So in that respect, what would you say the real purpose of cryptocurrency is? The real purpose is, is creating a better version of money. Simple as that. Not, not being a financial instrument or, or, or not uh, being a speculative tool. It's, it's just money. Uh, same things that we, that we use euros or dollars or, or shillings for. The same thing uh, we have to be able to use cryptocurrency for. And we have to be able to rely on the currency. Trust it. Mm -hmm. so obviously, in that respect, uh, you know, if you talk about kind of the mainstream world, you know, every most people on the street, they don't really trust cryptocurrencies, at least not right now. Absolutely not. Why would you say they don't trust them, and how would you say that DAG coin could build that trust that other cryptocurrencies haven't? I, I believe there's a few reasons why, why people don't trust. One of the main, main ones is, uh, is the price volatility, how much the price uh, fluctuates. Um, and um, I, I think this is so far the biggest obstacle for people to really start using cryptocurrency, which actually by nature it is, it's much more convenient and faster way to, and much more liberate way to use your money. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you accept, or let's say you get paid in, uh, in cryptocurrency and after, after a few days the, the price is 10% 10, 10 less or 20% less or, or even more, then what, what do you do? You won't have enough money to actually survive the whole month. So stability is something that is, is crucial when it comes to money. And I believe where, where everything went wrong is that the community has, you know, they want to think that uh, cryptocurrency is same as money. And if, if, if uh, fiat currencies, they are valued based on supply and demand, then crypto should be valued the same way. But you know, how, how did fiat currencies uh, mm, get started at first place? You know, they, were, they were backed by something. They were backed to a, a fundamental value. Initially, it was, it was metals, it was gold. So uh, once, only once the community was, was huge and stable, that is when 
when the valuation model for, for fiat currencies changed. So I believe the same way should be done with cryptocurrencies. But in the beginning, it should be, let's say, based on some fundamental value. And once the community is huge, and it's huge is not millions or tens of millions, the community, community should be hundreds of millions of people, only then it is wise to go uh, on, a, on a, let's say, free market uh, valuation model. Because then, then everything is stable. You know, media cannot affect a currency that much then. Right now, whatever you want to write, you can, you can put it up on the internet. Whether people believe it or not, it depends where you put it up. And, and there is so much uh, rubbish and there is so much noise about, uh, about different currencies and people don't know what to believe. They like to believe the good things, but there are also a lot of bad things going out there. So um, that is something that really, really affects the, the belief into the currency. Therefore, also that the price changes. Um, it is something that should be avoided, I believe. And, and that is one thing that we really want to avoid. Um, therefore, that coin is valued by fundamental parameters, the size of the community, users and merchants. And, uh, and in, in a later stage, uh, of course, there will be usage as well, how many transactions are being done uh, and, and different features of the ecosystem. Like possibilities, what you can do with the currency. And the final stage is, of course, free market. But for that, the community has to be big. It has to be stable. And that's, that's the only way how to actually build up a currency. Okay, what, in what countries do you think DAGCoin will make the most impact and can be adopted into the, the economic frameworks of the countries? The, the easiest? The easiest. Um, that's a tough one because you know, there is in um, in the regulations there are so many changes. You know, countries there are countries that say we support cryptocurrencies. We don't support now. We support again. No, we don't support. But now we're we're thinking about what to do. I believe it's just a game. You know how I see the situation right now is that there is there is a group of of crypto enthusiasts who see that crypto is uh, is something where we, where we can hide everything we do, where we can do things anonymously. I don't think it's the right approach because what is really needed is full transparency. Transparency is needed from our side, the users, and also from the government side. So what we actually want to do is we want to create a system where all the transactions are transparent. You know, what the users do, what the businesses do, what merchants do, the same way uh, what governments do. Because um, when I've been talking with different, uh, different, uh, I would say entrepreneurs in, in various countries, also government people, government officials uh, on, on different levels, what I've found out uh, is that a lot of people are not fond of paying taxes. And the reason for that is that there is no trust. They see that, yeah, we pay the taxes, but what is the tax money used for? That politicians put promise that it's used for the, this and that and that, but actually it's not used for those things. There is no improvement in those areas. And this is the place where I see that, uh, that proper cryptocurrency can actually come in the game. Um, what is important for the governments is that they see what, what their people do. What is important for criminals that nobody sees what they do. You know, cash is very easy to use for crime. Right now, a lot of cryptocurrencies are also very easy to use for crime. But if the system is built in a way that there is full transparency through the, the chain explorer, then uh, this is something that governments would be much more um, prone to accept because why governments are playing right now, you know, we support, we don't support, they're trying to win time. Everybody knows that you know, crypto is the, the direction where to go to. There are so many benefits over, over fiat money. Cover, every government knows that. Their challenge is to make sure that cryptocurrency is not used for crime. And um, if we manage to build up a system in a way that the regular people 
all can have access to cryptocurrency. All of the transactions are uh, transparent. All of them are visible that the government can see that. I don't need to see what you do, Mark, and you don't need to see what I do. But there is an authority that actually needs to know that we are not doing any crime. Make sense? Mm -hmm. The same way, you know, I don't need to see exactly that, you know, that uh, that government department is uh, is gathering that much money and now they're using for that and that and that. But there has to be an authority that we can trust that can have access to all of those uh, reports which are recorded on the chain. That means they are true. And if we know that that kind of authority exists, we can trust that whatever we pay for taxes, it actually goes for the right, for the right thing. And this is something that can actually bring out a lot of black business and turn it into white. Governments will have a lot of tax money coming in. And what we feel is that, you know, healthcare is getting better, educational system is getting better, the whole infrastructure is getting better. This is the, this is the result. And uh, this is actually the, the approach that every cryptocurrency should have. This is the approach that we are, uh, that we have and that we follow. And I believe this is something that actually governments can really work with because it's, it's an it is an improvement. It's not a, a hole where criminal things can be, can be moving. But obviously you said that it's like creating an authority that is able to see all of this information. Obviously I can't see your transactions, I can't maybe see what the different government transactions are, but you know, what kind of authority would be created? Would it be a new government department? Would it be an independent kind of non-profit or organisation? How, how, would it, how would it be done? Would it be done on a national level? Would it be done on an international level? How would that actually work? And also, how would I know, or you know, that the tax that you went, you obviously paid, went to, let's say it went to the education department. How would you know where that money then went? Yeah, so it, uh, it can be many ways. It can be a government department. It can be uh, an independent auditing uh, authority. Uh, the important thing is that whatever information there is, it is stored in a chain. Is it blockchain? Is it tag chain? You know, I believe all of all of different uh, distributed ledgers they they can and they will coexist. It's not that you know blockchain is bad and tag chain is good or tag chain is bad and blockchain is good. Different uh, different uh, ledgers have their own purposes, and then something is uh, better for a certain area and some other some other thing is better better for another area so all of this information all of these transactions and transaction is also exchange of information for example all of them they are stored and we don't need to trust anybody we don't need to trust uh, other people we don't need to trust any any organization but everything is stored and we just know that the technology is built up in a way that it is correct, that it is true. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, from if you take like, the, the majority of people, they obviously want to know that that information is safe. Mm -hmm. So if I make a transaction to you or to anybody, or I pay something, people want to know that that information is safe. You know, it's not going to be misused in any way. So they have to know that the authority that's able to view this information or the government department that's able to view it, that it wouldn't be misused mm -hmm. or yep. abused in some way. Like how, how do you see that process working? Well, misusing information, uh, this, this kind of information, if it's happening today, you know, I'm sure in, in some countries it's happening more, in some countries it's happening less. But it is, it's something that, uh, you know, this information is out there anyways. Uh, as of today, you know, most probably there is no records of, uh, of who is accessing that information. 
if if we use distributed ledger technologies, then uh, we can have uh, immutable information on who has access to which information. If if you work in a in any country's uh, tax authority today and you want to spy on somebody, you just you go, you see the information, you later on you erase the logs, and um, nobody sees that you were seeking for some kind of information. Thanks to this distributed ledger technology, you cannot erase any logs. So it is something that you know that if you do something bad, and if somebody wants to check, they will find out. I think this is, this is a very big step forward. Um, generally, there is, uh, of course, there is possibility that, you know, I don't trust the system, I don't trust the technology, but a better technology in any case is better than, than a worse technology. And, and using distributed ledgers, then that is, it is way better than systems that there are today. So if you like talk, if you like say use that example, if you take someone like Maduro in Venezuela that they've talked about, you know, he's kind of laundered like hundreds of millions from the government. And you can talk about maybe other government officials and leaders all around the world. So would you say when you, when you have that information and when it can't be deleted or changed, can you see that there's going to be potentially much less government corruption Absolutely. than there is right now? Absolutely. This is actually, this is what uh, initially crypto community uh, was focusing on. The whole purpose of, of this technology is to minimize the, the level of, uh, of corruption. So in, in some countries it will be very fast. There are, there are even governments that, that are very, very keen on becoming completely transparent. There are governments that are not so keen on that where it will take much longer time. But if there are already a few good examples where the government departments and, and all the processes, the systems are transparent, and let's say in our country it's not transparent, then, then the people in our country, they, they're gonna raise up, they're gonna say, hey, come on, why can't we have something like that? Those people there, everything is transparent. Everything is honest. We want the same thing. And this is what is needed, and this is where, where, how it will change. Even the most corrupt countries, if they are um, surrounded by transparency, there is there is actually no reason, and um, and there is much less possibility for them to be corrupt, because usually what's happening the the funds, the government funds, they're moving out of the country. Where can they move if 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 the majority is already transparent? But on that note. You talk about how cryptocurrencies were developed to kind of reduce corruption and increase transparency, but yet many governments around the world, especially you know, in what people see as like open democracies, are very not afraid. Maybe they're very skeptical because a lot of the cryptocurrencies, like you said earlier, are being used for crime. Mm. You know that because they can, people can cover their tracks. How do you, like, where do you see that it went wrong? I think uh, criminals, they're very sharp, sharp people. And wherever there is a loophole, they will use it. Um, I don't think it's, it has gone very wrong in, in that sense. You know, there are systems that are being uh, used by corrupt people every day, especially new systems. You know, they are, they are the, the ones who actually find the loopholes and then, then the good guys are the ones who are going to patch them up and, and improve the system. That's how, that's how every, every system is being developed. So I think it's, it's a process and, uh, and this kind of starting or learning process for, for, for the whole uh, crypto sphere is, uh, you know, it, it's in the beginning. Uh, crypto is not here yet. It's far from, from that. Um, it will take maybe five years, maybe even 10 years for, for really to, to get to people's minds that, you know, there is such thing that is actually good. So um, I would say everybody who is uh, right now in, a, in the crypto sphere is a, is a pioneer. And we are, we are in complete jungle. 
So there are a lot of things that will improve. And, but meanwhile, we need to keep in mind and we need to understand that, that the system is not perfect yet. And everything that is not perfect, it can be abused. But that's only for a short period of time. Th things will change. So you were talking earlier about how governments obviously become more transparent and more accountable when they're using cryptocurrencies like DAOCoin. But when you have economic issues in a country, for example, um, when they, let's say the government wants to decrease interest rates or maybe put in a cash stimulus into the economy. Those kinds of things, when you have a certain percentage, for example, of a cryptocurrency on the market, it makes that much, much harder. Mm -hmm. So how can you, how do you see governments overcoming those economic issues when cryptocurrencies reach a certain saturation level? That's a tricky question. You know, there, is, um, there are possibilities in cryptocurrency that um, you will have a fixed uh, supply, fixed amount of coins, or you don't have it fixed. You have unlimited supply. And um, what I personally believe is that eventually every country in the world will have their own cryptocurrency. Yeah? Europe will, have, will use a common one, hopefully. But um, the way government cryptocurrencies will be built is, is definitely in a way that governments can um, do those injections. So if the supply is unlimited, you know, they, can, they can issue more coins where, where or when they need. And now, what I believe also is that there will be four, five, six um, global currencies that actually belong to the people. And uh, those are something that, that really will, uh, will be trusted by people. A government cryptocurrency, it's a better version of, of, of fiat currency. But a people's cryptocurrency is something that, uh, that gives huge benefits to, to the users and especially the, to the early adapters. Because you know, no government will give you or me or anybody else a possibility to actually capitalize on the currency itself. But the people's currency is built the way that today most cryptocurrencies are built. That, you know, when it's small, when, when it's not popular, when it's not really usable or used, the value is, is much lower and when it becomes grows bigger and, and becomes more usable the value is, is higher so uh, I believe there will be there will be these four or five currencies that that will uh, give huge financial benefits to, to the people who start to use them and, uh, and the government cryptocurrencies they are just um, it, it is kind of like uh, uh, a symbiosis of, uh, of fiat currency and a people's cryptocurrency. Kind of like a hybrid. Kind of like so, a hybrid. Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Yeah. So that the government, they can still operate in the way that they are used to, till the moment there comes better solutions. And, and people, they will be able to, of course, use the government, uh, government cryptocurrency, but thanks to transparency, the governments should be and hopefully are also accepting uh, those global currencies, which people would, would want to use more. And that, that creates a question in itself is would, obviously, if the governments are creating their own currencies and you've got your kind of a few global currencies, how do those, if, if the government allows, obviously, those currencies to be used within their territory, how would you see them coexisting with each other? Um, I, I don't see any big problem in that, as it, I don't 
I don't believe that there would be a possibility for everybody to use one currency. It's just, it's not just possible. Um, I prefer something, you prefer something else. And uh, that's how people are. But, uh, you know, even today there are, there are uh, systems where you can actually swap one currency to another very quickly. And, uh, well, today the fees are still quite high. But in the future, what I believe is that swapping bet between uh, one crypto to another is, is instant and, and bears basically no cost. So, um, how things will work out, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. But uh, one, one possible scenario for sure is that, that people, they, they usually hold in one currency, but when they want to pay, then, then there's a quick swap and, uh, and the merchant uh, accepts the other currency. Mm -hmm. The same way that, that right now a lot of, uh, a lot of companies are, are actually using crypto and fiat exchange for that. You know, all of these uh, cards, these are master cards or, or these platforms that say that, you know, now you can use crypto in hundreds of thousands of hotels or, or you can book your tickets or, uh, or uh, you can purchase uh, vouchers. You know, all what they do is they actually, they take crypto from you, they exchange it to fiat currency and they pay euros or dollars to the merchant, to the hotel. And it's, it's not really accepting cryptocurrency, right? And, and there are huge fees involved in that. But when it's crypto to crypto, then this already makes a little bit sense. But at the same time, it can't be this way that, that you know, you have a separate cryptocurrency for, for, uh, for uh, every industry. You know, you, you buy your groceries with, uh, with grocery coin and you, you, you pay for gas with gas coin and, uh, and you pay your rent with rent coin. That doesn't make sense. But uh, if, let's say, in, in one country, let's say in Europe, there is Eurocoin and, uh, and you are holding that coin, then wh wherever you want to pay uh, in Europe, then it, it instantly swaps from one to another. Then it's not that confusing. But at the same time, you know that if I'm holding my, my assets in that coin, it's a currency that has limited supply. It doesn't, nobody devalues the currency. So you feel more secure, but at the same time, wherever you can use it, there's a quick swap and it's, it's paid in the local currency. That is, I think that is one, one very possible scenario that, that can happen in the okay. future. So you see basically a world where you hold a particular currency. It might be Eurocoin, but you might go to somewhere that, or another country, another area, um, another vendor which accepts another. Mm -hmm. And you can use your currency, but it's just simply converted as you pay. Exactly, exactly. But that conversion, it has to be super cheap. You know, it's, it's ridiculous to, to pay high conversion fees. I understand that right now a lot of companies are, are doing that because they can. Mm -hmm. And you know, people are so excited about the cryptocurrency that they're willing to pay 5% or 10% fees even. But uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's, I, I think it's wrong. The, the purpose of crypto is make things easier, faster, more convenient, more accessible. Why to make it more expensive? Mm -hmm. So I, I believe this ex exactly this conversion in the future, it should be and it will be very cost effective and very fast. So in what way do you think dark chain technology helps to do that? Well, dark chain technology, it helps to create um, a currency that is scalable and, and a lot of people can use, which a currency which hopefully will become one of those global currencies. Um, dark chain technology itself, it doesn't help in, in creating those uh, conversions, swaps. But it is, it's definitely something that, that can work with other currencies and that, that can, be, can work with other technologies. Um, it's, it is just, just uh, one technology on which different, different coins can be built on. So um, I believe that that chain as a technology is, is, uh, is suitable for a, for a large scale cryptocurrency.
for a large-scale currency mm. money. In that sense, what would you see would be the differences between the blockchain and the DAG chain in terms of that scalability to becoming one of these kind of top, you know, five or six global currencies? As of today, um, blockchain is not scalable yet. It's a possibility that uh, that it will be improved, and in the future. Uh, the amount of transactions that can be done on blockchain is is much much higher, and hopefully it will happen. Um, I'm not a big fan of of patching something, so uh, building uh, scalability scalability layers on on something. You know, I'm much more interested in in creating something that is already scalable by its core architecture. Uh, that is that is what tag chain is about you know, in the first layer in the core being scalable so um, if you look 10 years into the future then of course we don't know what what will be the the best or the most scalable uh, technology uh, yet we can assume we can predict how many transactions when we talk about money then how many transactions are being done in the world today and how many will be maybe done in the future, then when we talk especially about um, money and using money, doing payments, then uh, if there is a cryptocurrency that can do a few hundred thousand transactions per second, then that is more than enough. So. Uh, I would say that uh, the DAG chain is very suitable for uh, for uh, small communities, big communities and very big communities. Blockchain as of today is only suitable for small communities. It's not suitable for, for something global. In the future, might be. But uh, as of today, uh, there are challenges. And, uh, and therefore, DAG chain for sure uh, is is much better version uh, or much better technology to use for uh, for the underlying technology of, of a cryptocurrency that, that is aiming to be one of those global currencies. But with you, with with DAG coin, for example, obviously it's based on DAG chain, which is more scalable than the blockchain. But DAG coin, for example, has a finite number of coins, which is about nine billion. If you take a big cash economy, for example, like India, they have in circulation maybe around $500 billion US dollars worth of rupees. And there's only 9 billion DAG coins. So if even a small percentage of the Indian population starts using DAG coins, anything around a dollar, two dollars, ten dollars, or more, or even sometimes more becomes a price in the shop which is 0.1 or 0.0009. How do you see, I see that as a big problem in scalability because nobody wants to go to the shop or the online store and figure out all of these 0.00 or 0. something mm -hmm. prices. It's very difficult to calculate how much do I have, how much does this cost? Absolutely. That would be a huge challenge, right? But um, how, how, uh it's built is that that uh, one DAG coin, one DAG itself, is a thousand milliDAGs, and one milliDAG is a thousand micro DAGs. So when the value of of, uh, of one DAG becomes very high, then we will every day we will use milliDAGs. So we will use a smaller uh, denomination of uh, of a DAG. Okay, so basically what you're saying is it becomes a reverse of a fiat currency. So if we go back 50 years or so, you could go to the shop now and buy, obviously we didn't have euros then, but if you take something like pounds, for example, for just a few pence, you could go and buy a loaf of bread or a cup of tea, and now it costs two or three pounds or two, mm. three, four, five dollars. So this increases, whereas with crypto you're saying it's going to decrease. It's going, it's going the opposite way. It, it can be taken this way, a little bit. But uh, basically, 
when uh, when we want to have something that is one euro and, and when, when one DAG is worth a thousand euros, then what do we do? We just use one micro DAG. That will be one that will be one uh, one euro. So would you say in that sense it's scalable down infin infinitely? Not infinitely, but sufficiently. Okay. Because obviously you've got obviously as time goes on, the years go on, the generations go on, inflation is obviously increasing all the time. So the currency like, has to react to that in some way. Yeah, if you put it in numbers then there's a very long way to go. There is sufficient sufficient uh, scalability on that. Warren Buffett said that cryptocurrencies will come to a bad end. What do you think made him think like that? Mm, I think he sees what is, uh, what is right now happening on the market. Yeah, it's, it's a, cryptocurrency is a very speculative uh, tool as of today. And uh, I, I believe Warren Buffett knows, knows a little bit about markets and also knows a little bit about market manipulation and how things can affect and how things can end up. Um, I would say that everything that is abused can, uh, can come to a very bad end. But uh, let's say cryptocurrency, if, if the industry continues the way that, they, that is going right now, I would agree with Warren Buffett. But if we think and talk about how crypto should be and what it's meant for, then uh, then I would completely disagree. So uh, changes have to come to the market. Uh, luckily, I, I see a lot of companies already now focusing, not a lot, but some companies already now focusing on, on usability and, and really what, what crypto is, is here for. So um, I, I see that we are not alone working for the right, for the right goal and, and working for the right future of cryptocurrency. And I believe that there will be a very beautiful story coming, evolving. In a very simple way, in what ways would you say Dadcoin can prove Warren Buffett wrong? In becoming a stable and usable currency, where people can uh, use that currency on a daily basis, that is a beautiful story. That is a beautiful future. And, and this is what we are working towards. In that sense, how would you say Dadcoin makes payments easier, perhaps, than other cryptocurrencies and maybe even regular fiat currencies? It, it, very, much depends on, uh, it very much depends on the country, because um, different areas in the world they are uh, in very different situations. Uh, in Europe and in the US, there, there is actually not a big need for cryptocurrency. I mean, it's a, it's a very nice to have thing, but especially if you focus on uh, if you focus on on third world countries, uh, Africa, especially where um, where the access to digital money is very very less, and uh, where the infrastructure infrastructure uh, for banking is not there. Um, those are the areas where where actually that coin can influence the most. And, uh, and that is where actually cryptocurrency generally will have the biggest, uh, biggest impact. And uh, if you give a person access to something that he hasn't had before, money, then you know, how, how can it change that person's life? 180 degrees. So, uh, so people can, can actually uh, get paid in a way where they have a credit history, they can use that money in much wider, um, in much more possibilities than, uh, than they can actually do with their cash. Uh, the cost of, of any crypto transaction uh, with Dagoin is, it is so small that you don't even feel that. Um, whereas in, uh, in, a, in a few African countries, uh, there are mobile payments that are very popular. 
uh, over the cellular network. You know, for us, let's say in Europe, the cost of the transaction is, is you know, it, it, it's cheap. But if you look at the amount that those people are sending, they're sm sending small amounts. And, and uh, the cost percentage wise of the transaction is very high. So eventually, people who actually have the least, the poorest people, they end up using the most expensive, uh, proportion-wise, most expensive services. And that is wrong. There are companies who can do that, but it's, it's the wrong thing to do. Therefore, cryptocurrency for, for, I would say, half the population in the world Will, will make all the transactions cheaper. It will give two or two and a half billion people access to actually banking and, and money. So that's a huge thing. You know, when you talked about, right at the very beginning, about a vision, is that maybe something you see as a vision? Like giving two and a half billion people potentially a bank history and access to, access to money that they don't have right now. You know, the vision is very simple, you know, giving everybody the access to money, everybody. If we elaborate on that, you know, what can that mean? You know, having access to, to digital money gives you the banking history. Uh, what can it enable? It can give you a possibility to apply for a loan. Like if, if you can't prove that you have uh, steady income, if you get paid in, in cash, for example, but you need a loan, you want a loan to uh, maybe start the business or, or you are uh, a small uh, uh, you have a small business you're selling fruits on the street or you have a small let's say uh, kiosk on the street you don't use bank everything is in cash but if you want to grow bigger and you want a loan for that what can you do you have to go to uh, not a loan a loan office but you have to go a loan shark who will uh, who will give you the loan, but you will have to pay a lot, lot more back. And if you don't, then you will lose an arm or a leg. That doesn't seem reasonable. You, you want to expand your business. Now, but if, if all of your business is, is in crypto, then you have all of that transaction history. You can prove to a loan office that, listen, I have a steady income. I have a steady business. I have a lucrative business. I just need a little bit more to, to, uh, to scale it. But that you know, brings up another question because there aren't right now, for example, you, you can have your little business selling fruit or something else, but there isn't right now a credit institution which will, for example, give you a loan in Dacoin directly. How do you see, obviously you can prove what your income is, what you're receiving, but you're going to have to receive that loan in the fiat currency of the country or potentially maybe even an, another cryptocurrency that they do allow? I don't see that as a challenge. Even, even if, uh, if I have a business abroad in, in some other currency, but if I can prove that I have income, then there are loan offices that uh, credit institutions that are, are accepting that. And uh, if right now there is no uh, credit institution that will give a loan in DAX, and they will give the loan in, uh, in some other currency. Okay, but would you see there potentially being any obstacles in getting to the point where they accept that credit history and they accept that as being able, as being proof of steady income to enable a loan no. in another currency? As long as the, the currency grows, as long as the community grows and it becomes more usable, there is uh, more liquidity in the market, which will come over time. Absolutely no, no obstacle. Throughout, uh, throughout this year, there will be several uh, very interesting services coming out that will grow the whole ecosystem of, of Dacoin very wide. And um, I think this is, this is the year where, where we can prove a lot of things and we can show how a cryptocurrency actually should be growing. Are you able to tell us any of those things? Yeah, on the, on the last conference actually we revealed a lot of the ecosystem that we are planning for this and next year. So there is something with loans and uh, there is, there's actually a lot of things that, that come out. And the easiest, easiest uh, way is to go on the website and, and see how much there is and, and what we are working on. So you, know, you touched on 
the developing world, and you touched on, you know, small business owners. Um, but kind of what market sectors and, and companies do you see taking on board DadCoin the soonest? Mm, here I would, I, I guess I would general, generalize a little bit uh, DadCoin and cryptocurrency uh, as, as a whole. As I believe that right now it's not the right moment to really much talk about using a cryptocurrency uh, in, a, in a sense that uh, when we want to use a currency, you know, the infrastructure has to be there. It doesn't make much sense that if, if I accept the currency, but my, my vendor, my suppliers don't accept it, then I have to go through an exchange house to convert this currency to another one. So um, what, what I would see is that the wisest approach for, for cryptocurrencies to actually expand is to expand through through merchants who have a very high um, margin on their products or services, because the amount of people using a cryptocurrency as of today is very small. So if if you have a hundred customers in your in your uh, cafe shop, and uh, two of them pay in cryptocurrency, then you don't even have actually a need to exchange that cryptocurrency back to fiat because it's such a small uh, part of your daily revenue. These kind of merchants are the best ones to actually start for, uh, for crypto adoption and crypto expansion. If, if we go for, uh, for uh, a merchant who has a very small margin, then for them it's crucial. But every exchange, there's a cost. So it doesn't really make sense uh, to actually accept crypto when you need to exchange it. So when, when, the, when the crypto community expands and, and it becomes more, more adopted, then more and more merchants will, uh, will come on board and it will give them the possibility that you know, if I come on board the, a little bit later, I already might have my vendors who already accept it. As of today, you know, whoever is coming on board is one of the first ones. So, um, as, as a token of, of appreciation to the nature of cryptocurrency or, or as, as a faith in the future, a lot of merchants are accepting and they, uh, they swallow the bitter fact that, that, you know, I do need to exchange and, and the cost becomes a little bit higher. But they just want to support the cost, they want to support the community. It, it would be also for the community, it would be the wisest to approach those merchants who have very high margin because then it's much easier. It's easier for, for the community and it is easier for the, for the merchants as well. But you say that obviously that it works when there's this high margin. So you've got a hundred, say, customers in the coffee shop and two paying cryptocurrency. But, you know, as a business owner, if only two customers out of a hundred would like to pay in that, is it worth the time and the effort to make it possible to make that payment, that, that payment option possible for the customers when they can also probably pay in cash or debit card or maybe even some other way? You know, the, the solution for the merchants that we have created, DagPay, it is so easy to set up. It's just a few minutes, maybe four, four or five minutes. And I don't think that's a long time. It's, it's actually very easy to set up. It's very easy to use, so uh, I, I, I'm sure that the benefit that the merchant gets is much, much bigger because we also have this platform, Merchant Finder, where if, if you as a merchant accept the currency, if you accept the coins, then you can uh, list yourself there and the whole community sees that, okay, there is a merchant who, accept, uh, who accepts the, the coins. So for four or five minutes of setting up, you will get a lot of marketing and potentially a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, attention and a lot more customers. Obviously, you know, you've got to convince them that this four or five minutes is worth the time. Because obviously anyone who owns a business, they're doing lots of things. They've got employees, they've got different locations, different products, different mm -hmm. things to attend. Is, is, is convincing them that that five minutes is worth it. 
and also it being in this early stage now, what you're in that they might they might go a number of days or weeks, perhaps even without customers mm-hmm. using that. And when they do receive money in DAG coins, maybe it's not so regular. Um, but maybe it's not regular, it's not very big, so it's not worth them converting the money back. So they might sometimes maybe have a few, what would be tens of euros or hundreds of euros um, that would be potentially maybe much more useful to them in a regular account rather than perhaps now having to convert it back. Uh, if, if it is something that they would really need to use, then for sure. But if, if you talk about uh, high margin merchants, then they will anyways have good profits. Um, therefore, I would say it's a very good investment in, in, a, in a growing cryptocurrency. And in the future, these tens of hundreds of euros, they can be hundreds or thousands of euros. They could be. Would you say in some respects then that it's, uh, like if you take the cafe example, it's much more of a, a customer service, a good customer service tactic for a business to take. Because if they say that they accept our coin, they accept this coin, they accept this coin, they take their four or five minutes for all of these various different coins, set up their, their ecosystems to accept them. Would you say then it's much more come, you can pay with whichever currency you use, and it's much more of a, a way to get crypto users to come to their cafe or to use their shop or chain? Yes, I would, I would say so. Because if, if I go to a cafe and I see that they accept uh, some cryptocurrency, I'm like, hmm, very nice, they're innovative. It shows the same uh, restaurant or cafe from a totally different, uh, different angle perspective. I, I think it would be an addition for sure for uh, for a merchant. So we touched on earlier the, a few examples in the developing world. When do you think the developing world will, will be ready to, to start to adopt cryptocurrencies and perhaps especially DAG coin? There are so many different countries where, where, where there are, even in the developing world, their development level is very different. Some have actually already started to think about it. Some uh, are taking their time. I think the next few years will already show how uh, how it it evolves and that it will show the support from from the first first uh, developing countries on uh, on adopting cryptocurrency. The first step, of course, is to act to uh, support and accept some uh, let's say global currency, and uh, and then definitely to see if they see that it, it works and, and people really like it, then they will definitely come out with their own as well. And eventually, I believe every country will have their own. You've spoken quite a few times about the DAGCoin ecosystem and also what's coming this year. What do you think you're doing, what, what you're doing sets it apart from what's being done by other cryptocurrencies? I feel that a lot of cryptocurrencies are just focusing on the possibilities of, of buying and selling, trading, uh, having, having, having a financial gain. Um, I, don't, I don't support that kind of approach. You know, if, if you focus on the price, then uh, the good benefits of a cryptocurrency don't come out. If you focus on the good benefits, the real values of cryptocurrency, then the price will come by itself, by default. So uh, what is important for people to see and to feel is that the currency is usable. We can, we can do a lot of things with that. And therefore we are developing uh, so far the widest uh, ecosystem for cryptocurrency that there is. You know, we are focusing on, on all kinds of different services that, that people would want to use with their money. And we create those platforms ourselves just to show people how they can use it and give them the possibility to, uh, to really uh, transact with DAC coins on a daily basis. And I believe this is something that is, is very unique. The ecosystem is very wide. Uh, by end of this year, it's, it's definitely the strongest. And uh, next year, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make it even wider and, and, and stronger. 
And um, I, I believe this is the way how we can show to the people, to the world, how crypto actually works and that it really works as a money, as money, as currency. Um, there are different services for, uh, for merchants, different platforms for merchants to, to conveniently accept cryptocurrencies. There are platforms, uh, like I said, for example, Merchant Finder, which, which will show people where they can, uh, which merchants accept the coins, where they can use their currency. There are different platforms for, for charities. There are different shopping platforms for uh, uh, auction platform is coming. There is a person to person uh, exchange coming. There is um, a marketplace where individuals can, can sell their own, own, uh, own um, belongings, their own, own things, but whatever they want to sell uh, through TagPay, every merchant can actually accept, uh, every business can accept cryptocurrency. There are uh, platforms coming that, that actually help people to, to uh, hire somebody to find a job. There are platforms that uh, are for, for people who want to have fun, playing games, gamble for lottery. Uh, different platforms that uh, we would want to use in the financial world uh, for uh, storing money, doing, uh, taking loans, uh, transacting uh, deposits. Um, also this year we bring out the ATMs, uh, we bring out the gift cards. Uh, there is uh, different payment systems coming out. So there is a lot of things coming out for, uh, to show how serious this, this currency is. And um, once people understand that, you know, this currency is here to be used, that is, that is where I see the biggest growth for the community will come. And once we can show for a large community and within the large community, how actually cryptocurrency works within a certain community, then this is where the big players will come in. And under big, big players, I mean, I mean big merchant, big platforms, because they, they they want to be innovative, but they can't risk with their business. They they cannot go with something that is unstable and something that is uh, insecure. And therefore, they want to see first how a system, how an economy works, before they implement it. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for sharing your visions and um, insights into the groups of Sphere. I would say thank you, Mark, for inviting me here. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you.